All right, it's going to go into the horrors of mundane existence and the nature of evil and the nature of nature. Now, this is called theodicy in the modern uh, philosophical world. Uh, which is basically an attempt to answer why a good God would permit the manifestation of evil in the world. Because, as I always point out, there's a lot of evil in the world and not just human psychology. Uh, that's usually the, the uh, average person's um, view of evil in the world. If you tell them there's evil, they usually refer to human evil, wars, violence, you know, abuse. But the philosopher or someone who's really thinking we're talking about evil intrinsically placed in the world in the ways of the world the functions of the world at all levels and we're trying to answer this question so I'd like to point out uh, when we get into uh, anything that regard this uh, concept of God you basically have three types of people there's um, when people hear something like God, you have the fool who says, you know, like, amen, hallelujah. You know, when they hear these uh, concepts, I'm saved. You know, <laughs> they just jump right on it. You know, it maybe is intuitive, but, you know, they just jump right on it with no thought. And then you have the smart ass who, oh, that, that's bullshit can't be true it's outrageous i can't see that where what are you talking about bullshit you know that's a smart ass but then you have the wise person who says well what does that really mean so this is what we have here um basically we all know the common religious people a lot of you know thinking people would consider them to be sort of foolish basically but then we have the atheists who are the smart ass smart asses <laughs> who just throw every th they throw the baby out with the bathwater when we talk about God or anything um, behind this creation because to look at something created and to say nothing created it is kind of ignorant now what they do is they throw out these allegories uh they're able to disregard or de debunk the allegory which all it is when we mention this um sky guy with the beard it's an allegory and they debunk that and think that oh see gotcha no religion it's all bullshit uh or some of the uh atheists even go as far to say well look at the world is evil can't be a god the problem with that is um, you're automatically assuming that God means good. This is some part of the programming we have, and especially, you know, the, the modern world or with mass religion, we automatically assume God means good. But God could also be evil. So when they look at all the evil in the world or the, the fact that they don't see a God coming down from the sky, it must not be a God. But... Um, there's definitely some type of intention or awareness behind this. Now, the modern atheists like Dawkins and his crew, uh, who actually got stumped by Ben Stein. I'll put the link to that video. Even this idiot, <laughs> Ben Stein made him admit that, well, maybe some alien civilization created humans. It's like, fool, who made the aliens? Or what made the aliens? But, of course, that's based on the, the Big Bang, and the Big Bang is not even true. His false has been debunked. <laughs> the globe has been debunked. So we're in a whole new era anyway. So these atheists, they're really going to have to take it, in the, take it on the chin when they, if they ever accept Flat Earth. I don't know how uh, big Flat Earth is going to get in the mainstream because it's, it's system busting. But back to the point, uh, atheists always run to, oh, well, it's evolution. <laughs> and I'll, I'll read some quotes from guys who actually fell for the uh, heliocentric evolution big bang misinterpretation i mean it's a lie initially then evolution you know down the road people start believing in it i don't believe in monkey to man evolution um but even if you say something evolved like they say things like oh the dna evolved it adapted you're giving it a type of awareness or intention you just can't avoid it um the fact that you think and you create and we put things together 
the fact that we see something that was put together, there must be some time, some type of intention behind it. Now, it doesn't have to be a sky god or, or god, god in the sky, a man, you know, putting pieces here like Legos, and that's stupid, that's absurd. But there's definitely some type of um, formless consciousness behind it. Um, you can't deny it. I mean, they think the brain just thinks. Um, what ordered the brain into um, manifestation? Well, the de the atoms and the they came together, but was it random? Well, they ordered they. <laughs> See, when you say they, you're giving it some type of intention. You can't get around it. So it's clear there's something behind this creation. So that's why I say the wise person says, "Well, what do you really mean?" Uh, maybe there's no actual beings uh, hovering above uh, or uh, human-like, but something's behind this created thing definitely there's definitely some type of mind or awareness with intent behind this thing this creation and we're looking into the nature of it um is it good is it evil is it neutral so that's what this is about um now we know if we look at the world <laughs> it's a lot of suffering going on and like I said, we're not just talking about male and female psychology. We're talking about nature. We're talking about the functions, the processes of existence. Daily existence is full of suffering. And it's downright cruel. So this is a poem from um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, I believe. Um, and it's called uh, In Memoriam. He said, man trusted God was love indeed. And love creation's final law. Though nature, red tooth and claw, with ravine, shrek against his creed. And so this writer goes down to break this down. He said, Tennyson nailed it. We trust that God is love, but we also believe that God is the creator of nature. And nature simply does not seem to point to a God of love. Parasites, viruses, bacteria, diseases, and cancer kill millions and torment millions more. Humans and animals alike. Earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, mudslides, and volcanoes do the same. And the animal kingdom is, as Tennyson said, red in tooth and claw. Blood. So is the human kingdom, for that matter. The creation looks almost as much like it was created by a cosmic predator. As it does like it was created by an all-loving, peaceful, benevolent creator. So he's saying it's just as much as you could say it's a... Uh, uh, peaceful, all loving, and where people get this from is basically just scenes of nature, <laughs> like trees and sun rays and the beach, the sunset, the oceans, the flowers, and that's enough to delude people. You know, you know, just this visual, this aesthetically, this shallow, um, you know, the shallow vision, which they use to say that oh, it's beautiful, <laughs> but look below the grass and within the woods, and it's not so beautiful. But there seems to be a Lucifer principle at work in the world. As Howard Bloom noted, nature does not abhor evil. He says she embraces it. So, yeah. Obviously, nature does is not against evil. In fact, nature embraces it. And he goes on, this is the problem of natural evil. And it's arguably the most formidable objection that can be raised against the belief in an all-powerful, all-good God. I shall put natural in quotes when referring to natural evil to signify that I don't believe there's anything natural about it. Hmm. This is this writer. Um, I'll post a link to this website. Evil that humans inflict on one another can be explained by appealing to free will. But how are we to explain evils where there is no human agent responsible? So that's what I'm saying. You know, you say evil in the world. The first thing people do is to talk about what's on CNN. But no, we're going deeper. You know, we're talking about this creation itself and the way it functions. Um, those are the evils we're investigating. So, Charles Darwin, who, of course, is famous for this theory of evolution, like I said, which is um, it's kind of sketchy now, especially with there's no Big Bang. So this whole, you know, cosmic particles you know, evolve into, um, you know, slime, primordial slime, slime and uh, yeah, single cell, multi-celled, 
uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, uh, monkeys. You know, I mean, well, first of all, the dinosaur thing is also a lie. So, you know, but that whole monkey to man um, evolution thing has got to be re-questioning with um, the flat earth and the uh, no vacuum, no Big Bang. Uh, we're going back to um, the real cosmology. So that's suspect. But here we're using Darwin to quote uh, his observations of nature, which really don't necessarily have anything to do with his theories. So, of course... He studied nature for years. And this is actually what he had to say. Because um, he was actually, I believe he was Catholic at first. But after, you know, going on his studies, this is what he had to say. He, he wrote letters to his uh, brother. And he said, uh, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horribly cruel works of nature. Uh, that's what he saw, because <laughs> when you really look at it, like I said, look at these videos, man. Like, you gotta really look at it with the um, deprogrammed mind, because a lot of time we just look at it with this uh, mentality that it just, you know, oh, it's just nature. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, it's cruel. Like you said, it's wasteful. It's blundering. It's low and horribly cruel. And another uh, quote, he says, "There seems to be, there seems to me, too much misery in the world." I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the parasitic wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that the cat should play with the mice, you know, no, that, that the cat should devour the mice. Um, like, why would an all good God even think to design such a thing? It would be better off designing nothing. Um so this is where the uh, some of the atheists get off the God thing, too. Like, oh, whoa, surely there is no good sky God, <laughs> surely. And um, so now we're leaning toward either no God, which um, is kind of foolish to say there's nothing behind the created things. Or we're leaning toward what the Gnostics and other uh, even uh, philosophers would say, um, evil God. <laughs> basically um, not necessarily a, a being a monster in the sky but we're talking about an intention a consciousness uh, some awareness some type of mind behind this um, the Buddhists consider it a, a defiled mind it's, uh, they call it Mara <laughs> like uh, Mara is the Satan in Buddhism and that's what they uh, consider this uh, world to be of the Gnostics call it Demiurge like he said I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the parasitic wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that the cat should play with the mice. Um, so some people mention, oh, well, <laughs> the cat's not evil. <laughs> it's just when they eat the mouse, it's evil. But my, see, but the thing is, if he didn't eat the mouse, he wouldn't exist. So you're still stuck with the point. That there would be no function if you didn't eat the mouse. Like the cat is not here for us to come along and pet it. <laughs> and say how beautiful nature is. And how nice the cat is. No that cat wouldn't exist if it didn't have its canine teeth. Or its claws. I don't know if they have canines. But you know their sharp teeth. They're carnivores. Um, their whole existence. There's no existence without survival. And this is their survival. We're admitting the acts of survival are evil. This thing might just be evil. I mean, it's not its not a, a far-fetched concept when you look at the way this thing works. Like I said, even Darwin says this. So this is what um, says he, it led him to basically question nature and his, his God uh, that, that he grew up with. And he basically became sort of a uh, agnostic and, you know, said, oh, he went on to just uh, maybe it's just evolution. Uh, who knows what he really thought after that? Uh, but clearly <laughs> he wasn't persuaded with the interpretation given by the uh, you know, mainstream church at that time. Because he was no fool. I mean, come on. Obviously, a good all good force or mind wouldn't manifest this world at all. So here's uh, Clarence Darrow. He is another uh, famous so-called atheist. Um, 
Now, the advantage that the atheists do have as far as thinking is they just don't superimpose this this deluded concept that some uh, all good creator made this. They they look at it with honesty because, you know, a lot of people in the church, like especially when something bad happens, oh, don't question. You can't question God. Mysterious ways. No, no, no. <laughs> and it makes you that makes you stupid. <laughs> like that's stupid. I mean, you can't even have open minds. So they do have an advantage in some areas, especially when it comes to analyzing this creation. They have an advantage over um, these deluded mass religious people who just accept all the evils of the world and nature. And, like it's some kind of test or something. Like, it's crazy. It just gets sadistic. Let's even think that. So Clarence Darrow, who... Um, was another one of these, uh, you know, atheists. He was wise enough and clear-minded enough to analyze nature also. And so he had a debate with uh, some other guy. I'm just going to go through his, basically his spiel of what he thought about uh, nature and the evils and miseries and futilities of nature. Nothing is so cruel, so wanton, so unfilling as nature, she moves with the weight of a glacier carrying everything before her. In the eyes of nature, neither man nor any of the other animals mean anything whatever. The rock-ribbed mountains, the tempestuous sea, the scorching desert, the myriad weeds and insects and wild beasts that infest the earth, and the noblest man are all one. Each and all are helpless against the cruelty and immutability of the resistless processes of nature. They're resistless. You can't resist them. Whichever way man may look upon the earth, he is oppressed with the suffering incident to life. It would almost seem as though the earth had been created with malignity and hatred. If we look at what we are pleased to call the lower animals, we behold a universal carnage. We speak of the seemingly peaceful woods, but we need only look beneath the surface to be horrified by the misery of that underworld. Hidden in the grass and watching for its prey is the crawling snake, which swiftly darts upon the toad or mouse and gradually swallows it alive. The hapless animal is crushed by the jaws and covered with slime to be slowly digested and furnishing a meal. The snake knows nothing about sin or pain inflicted upon another. He automatically grabs insects and mice and frogs to preserve his life. Selfishness the spider carefully weaves his web to catch the unwary fly, winds him up into the fatal net until paralyzed and helpless, then drinks his blood and leaves him an empty shell. Damn. The hawk swoops down and snatches a chicken and carries it to his nest to feed his young. The wolf pounces on the lamb and tears it to shreds. The cat watches at the hole of the mouse until the mouse cautiously comes out. Then, with seemingly fiendish glee, he plays with it until tired of the game, then crunches it to death in his jaws. The beasts of the jungle roam by day and night to find their prey. The lion is endowed with strength of limb and fang to destroy and devour almost any animal that it can surprise or overtake. There is no place in the woods or air or sea where all life is not a carnage of death and terror and agony. Like, damn, he just described it in, in colorful detail. I mean, this goes on every day. Mother Nature? Come on. You know, these people are deluded. People are liars. You know this is going on. You know, definitely not a good guy behind this. Or no good mind behind this. I'm sorry. Continuing. Each animal is a hunter and in turn is haunted by day and night. No landscape is so beautiful or day so balmy, but the cry of suffering and sacrifice rends the air. When night settles down over the earth, the slaughter is not abated. For some creatures see best at night, and the outcry of the dying and terrified is always on the wind. Almost all animals meet death by violence and through the most agonizing pain. Yeah, like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they die in pain. Like, even some people, I heard some carnivores <laughs> try to act like animals don't experience as much pain as we do. Um, now, I know the average person 
it's a block as you put up because a lot of people don't want to face this truth. Um, so, you know, good luck with that. But the truth is, they feel pain. And there's a lot of pain in nature. It's intentionally designed this way. It functions this way. Um, to say that, um, you know, like I said about the cat thing, uh, well, the cat's good. <laughs> You know, it's just not until it just devours the mice, then it it gets evil. But like I said, it wouldn't exist. So to just assume that this there will be this cat walking around, and that well that's good. <laughs> but he wouldn't be walking around if he didn't have the calories he stole from the mouse. This is delusion. This guy's being up front. This is Clarence Darrow. Continuing, with the whole animal creation, there is nothing like a peaceful death. Nowhere in nature is there the slightest evidence of kindness or consideration or feeling for the suffering and the weak, except in the narrow circle of brief family life. And that's true. Man furnishes no exception to the rule. He seems to add the treachery and deceit that the other animals in the main do not practice to all the other cruelties that move his life. Man has made himself master of the animal world and he uses his power to serve only his own ends. Man at least kills helpless animals for the pleasure of killing alone. For man himself there is little joy. Every child that is born upon the earth arrives with the agony of the mother. And we went over that. From childhood on the life is full of pain and disappointment and sorrow. From beginning to end it is the prey of disease and misery. Not a child is born that is not subject to disease. Parents, family, friends, and acquaintances, one after another, die and leave us bereft. Yeah. The noble and the ignoble life meets the same fate. Nature knows nothing about right and wrong, good and evil. Pleasure and pain, she simply acts. She creates a beautiful woman and places a cancer on her cheek. She may create an idealist and kill him with a germ. She creates a fine mind and then burdens it with a deformed body. And she will create a fine body, apparently for no use, whatever. <laughs> she may destroy the most wonderful life when its work has just commenced. She may scatter tubercular germs broadcast throughout the world. She seemingly works with no method, plan, or purpose. She knows no mercy nor goodness. Nothing is so cruel and abandoned as nature. To call her tender or charitable is a travesty upon words and a stultification of intellect. No one can suggest these obvious, obvious facts without being told that he is not competent to judge nature and the God behind nature. If we must not judge God as evil, then we cannot judge God as good. In all other affairs of life, man never hesitates to classify and judge. But when it comes to passing on life, and the responsibility of life, he is told that it must be good. Hypocritical. Although the opinion beggars reason and intelligence and is a denial of both. Like, damn, yeah. Hey, everything goes out the, out the window when it's time to, you know, <laughs> follow the course of nature. You know, like I said, then we just resort to animal stupidity. You know, of course, right? Intellectually, I am satisfied that life is a serious burden, which no thinking, humane person would wantingly inflict on someone else. So that's Clarence Darrow. That's how he sees it. <laughs> that's how he sees Mother Nature. So, clearly, <laughs> I, this is not a good <laughs> creation, basically. Um... If you want to call it good, you have to admit that you're um, you're superimposing something on it that's really not there. Um, and, you know, I'll accept that. Or I'll accept your, you know, your belief. You believe what you want to believe. But um, clearly, this is designed. Uh, it inflicts pain. It's um, it's basically a bunch of stealing. Um and I'll read a quote from Buddha to wrap this up. So this is one of the sutras. And it's not necessarily Buddha talking. You know, this is just uh, their philosophy. And they put it in story form. He's just discussing, um, you know, so where does all this come from? And like I said, um, basically when you get into metaphysics, everything comes from mentality. Mentality doesn't come from a brain. Um, 
a mentality creates a brain. A mentality creates a lion, a gazelle, a bug, a plant. There's a mentality behind it. So he's asking the ways of the world. Um, where does this come from? And so this is what uh, is said. You know, this is what the Buddha character says. Greed and love feed on one another until greed becomes insatiable. As a result, in the world of all sentient beings, born of eggs, wombs, moisture, and by transformation, tend to devour one another for the nourishment of their bodies to the extent that their strength permits. And the basis for all of this is killing and greed. And see, that's from the uh, Buddhist Sutra. So basically what they're saying is the mentality behind the world is killing and greed. Peace.